Hey, welcome to Shop Talk number five, episode 373. It's one for the ages with two retired shop owners and one who's still working part-time and they share their experience over the years. Now, here's a taste. I insisted that my technicians train every year. My management team train every year. I paid for it. I sent them during office hours. I did not require them to go at night. Welcome, aftermarketers, to Remarkable Results Radio. Listen to learn just one thing from today's episode on your journey to remarkable results. Hi, Carm Capriato here, and in just a few minutes, you'll get to know Gary Summerfield, Don Griffin, and Tommy Kendall here on the Aftermarket's premier talk radio. Hey, but first, let me tell you that Federal Mogul's Garage Guru supports Remarkable Results Radio. So if you can't make it to a hands-on training session, Garage Gurus Online provides you with 24-7 access to the high-quality training you need to succeed. Online, on-site, and on demand. Find out more at fmgaragegurus.com. Here's a shout-out to new Facebook friends Brian Ordway, Todd Rao, and Ernie Malavasi and new LinkedIn connections, Roy Pollock and Bud Tabor. Are you in touch with our Remarkable community? We'll get inside of our ecosystem at remarkableresults.biz slash social. Glad you can join in and use the podcast for your go-to resource. Be a part of the aftermarket context revolution brought to you by the over 475 episodes in the Remarkable Results Radio Library. It seems that in every generation of successful owners, there's a constant mindset that remains the same. And the lesson that will resonate greatly in this episode is that over the years, a top winning strategy is to go above and beyond for your customer. Here's a question. Are you? In this episode recorded at ASTE in Cary, North Carolina, I'm with Gary Summerfield, Don Griffin, and Tommy Kendall, who offer a great source of information and business advice. They remind shop owners that training and technology and business is a requirement. If you're going to be in business today, even now more than ever before. Our talk also tackles technician pay, including ideal entry level rates and why it's important to hire a technician who has a passion for the industry and what's the usual technician stereotype. Find the show's talking points for this episode at remarkableresults.biz slash E373. Hey, in the show close, I'll let you know of a shop tour I'm doing during Industry Week 2018, and I'd love to meet you there. Now, listen to Shop Talk number five. Hey, a warm welcome to three senior legacy members of the Independent Garage Owners of North Carolina. I'm here at ASTE in Cary, North Carolina. What a what a great event this has been, and um, you know. So I met Gary Sommerfeld. He stopped in to say hello a little while ago, and he goes, "Yeah, I'm I'm retired. Sold my shop. I'm fully retired." Carmi says, "I'm fully retired." And I said, "You know any other fully retired or almost semi-retired guys that would just love to come in and share a little wisdom with the industry?" And he goes, "Yep, I'll have it for you in two hours." So here we are. We're in the studio here at ASTE. But besides uh, Gary Sommerfeld is Tommy Kendall. Hello. Nice to have you here. Um, semi-retired, which means you must still be working a little bit. Yeah, I'm still working uh, three days a week. Uh, I enjoy being around cars, b- repairing cars, and seeing people happy about their car being repaired. That's important. Uh, you, so you're, you're managing a shop? Yes. Cool. Good for you. Uh, Gary, by the way, um, how many years did you own your shop? I first went in business for myself in 1975. I've been in the industry since the early 60s. I sold my business January 1st, 2017. Was it an internal uh, succession plan? No, actually, that was one of the mistakes I made. I didn't plan for my succession. I actually, or I was approached by a large company. And at the time, I talked to him two times, turned him down. Third time he called me. I had been thinking about it, and I thought, this is my window of opportunity. Even though if I would hang on for another three to five years, I might be able to get more money. I can get X amount of dollars now. And I'm 66 years old at the time. So I thought, I'm going to go through that window before it closes. Uh, smart move, smart move. Um, thank you for sharing that. Don Griffin is also with us, yeah. fully retired. Fully retired. Well, actually, I, I say fully, but I do do some work 
uh, when some of the guys still have electronic problems with their transmissions or they don't know quite what to do. So they give me a call, and I'll even go down to the shop, and, and I'll help diagnose it with them. So you're a transmission specialist, and so yeah. the guys will say, Call Don. So I'll, I'll go down. I'll go down with him, and I'll look it over, and then we'll see. We'll come up with a with a plan on how to how to repair it. Doctor Don, I, I, you know, <laughs> you actually look so distinguished. I know, yeah, very very good. So you know, both both Don and Gary have sold their business, and, and Tommy, you're you're kind of still in it. And I, I know you've got a lot of great wisdom for us, but your regret, I think you were saying, Gary was. Okay, uh, maybe I should have had an internal candidate, but I, but I took it and I ran because the window of opportunity. Trust me, I, I get it, I understand, and, and I'm sure a, a ton of other people. But any any other regrets from both of you that you know you would look back and say I could have, would have, should have done something different? I wish I would have ran my business a little bit different because I'm I'm such a hands on guy that I had to do everything. I did electronics. I did the diagnostics work. I I rebuilt all the foreign and hard transmissions and let the other guys build the, build the easy ones, because I because I just I just wanted to do them, and so I stayed into that real hard. And it's hard to be a technician and an owner at the same time. So I had I had a little bit of that was that was tough, and I, and I could tell when I, you know uh, I retired at sixty six. I'm sixty eight now. I planned it probably about six years in advance to work my way to retire because I, I knew I couldn't keep that pace up. But were you the, still the centerpiece of the business when you sold it? Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, and the, the current owner is still a transmission shop? Uh, still a transmission shop. They were able to deal with the fact that Dr. Don wasn't going to be there? Right. And did their business suffer because of that? Uh, no, actually, uh, uh, some of my customers had called me and asked me about them, and I told them to go ahead on down there if they had any problems. You know. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, you steered the trust factor exactly. to the new the, the gentleman that's got it now is really He's really a nice guy. His name's Rick Allen. He's, he's a really nice guy, uh, and he cares about the customers. And uh, they still call, still got the same number, even though my name's not on the building. Yeah. And they ask about me, where where am I, where am I? And he tells them I'm retired, you know, and stuff like that. And we get to talking, and, and some of them actually call me because I still have my number, and they still call me up and say, "What about Rick?" I said, "Well, go down, and he'll take care of you." Are they happy for the fact that you are retired? Uh, some of them are. Some of them really want me to work on their cars. I got a phone call just the other day of one of my customers. He said, I know you don't work on them. He said, but I need help. I said, okay. He said, I said, what's it doing? He said, it's making a bump. It's making a bump when you pull off. Yeah. And he's at, he's at the golf course where I play golf. I said, okay, where, where's the car? He said, it's outside. Jump in it. I hold the brake, hit the gas. Boom. I said, open the hood. And I said, See that right there? That's the mount. It's broke. Take it to the shop and fix it. He said, you're not going to do it? I said, no, I'm retired. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> that, that's, that's so funny. I said, I, said, I said, Mr. Lee, take the car down to the shop. I told him where to go. I said, you need to, you need to make I said, now, if you keep letting it go, it's going to break the rest of them because it puts a lot of stress on them. Does this stuff like this pull you back in, like it makes you regret? I, I, let, me, let me just go put some tools together, and I want to fix it right here, right Actually, now. Actually, no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Basically, you moved on. Yes. Yeah. You My, accepted what you did, tough decision, but you, you made a decision. It's something you worked your whole lives toward. Yeah. Yes. And you moved on to step two. Now, But you're here. The, the, the really cool thing here is, and, and I've seen this at uh, ATE in Seattle, so many of the retired former members and shop owners that have either sold or retired hang out. And they're there, and they're and they're with their friends, and they're just talking. I, I, if you're talking business, you're helping people out, or you're just talking. Well, as you know, I'm still in the IGO. They made me yeah. a lifetime member. Uh, and, so and I was in the Hall of okay. Fame last year. Congratulations! And I didn't want to get out. And I enjoy my knowledge, and I enjoy helping people. And these these guys are like my brothers. All all of the guys in the IGO are like my brothers. They call me. I come running. Because I don't, because I want to help. I want to make sure that they, you know, uh, if they got a problem, I want to help them fix it. Here's the big thing. Yeah, you guys are serving, continuing to serve. Mm-hmm. Your knowledge is so strong. Your wisdom is sharp. Still, being able to give. When you do this for your fellow former, well, your current members, your lifetime yeah. members, do they just thank all over you for helping them out? Oh, good Lord, yes. Uh, you know, they appreciate it. A lot of times they go down and get a free lunch. <laughs> yeah, sometimes sometimes they kind of demand it. You know, yeah. I, I graduated from 
high school in 58, they tell me, they say, well, we, we've got to have you around to work on these older cars. Nobody else wants to work on them. There's no such thing as adjusting the idle on one nowadays. There's no such thing as adjusting the timing on one nowadays. When those cars came in, the guys don't understand how you do things like that. So they tell me, they say, uh, we need to keep you around because we've got these old cars. I've got a 58 Chevy in the shop right now that I'm working on. That was the year I graduated. And uh, I really enjoy that sort of thing. And they say they need me. They say you can't. You can't retire because we need somebody to work on these cars. You should have seen. You should have seen Tommy's face when he said, "The year I graduated." Yeah. He just had this big smile. So, as an example, guys, what have you helped somebody with recently? No, don't mention names or anything. But what if some of the guys says, "Hey, Gary, I'm working on this. You got any thoughts?" Well, a lot of times, I'm just an information source for other garage owners. They'll call me and talk to me for supplies for complete units don built transmissions i suggested that they go to xyz company and purchase it simply because it was faster they did a good job and they had a long-term warranty different it's like what would gary do yeah different vendors that i dealt with okay whether you know whether it was major components minor components just a quick source to save them time and money and hopefully help them with their bottom line. How about business advice? Quite often, uh, I gave business advice. Sometimes it wasn't wanted, but I gave it anyway. Ah, I love, but I love this. And you gave it because you knew someone needed to get it. Am yes. Right? Okay. Uh, they were headed down the path of what I always said: getting into the red ink. You see that there's a struggling shop, and you you say you give advice that they didn't want, but but did you say? Hey, Bobby, let's go have coffee. Is that kind of how it starts? Quite often, I'm in the shop with them. Oh. And I'm pointing things out. And, you know, they would uh, think I was kind of degrading their operation. to them and, yeah. you know, because, you know, they, they haven't been able to kind of step out and, and realize that they need to be a student. Yes, and, and I would hope at that time when I was talking to them that would cut through all the emotional garbage and let's just do the job. And this is what the end result will be. If you just do what I tell you to do, even though I don't own your business, have nothing to do with it, but I still want to see you successful. I'm talking with Anthony Frowine, a technical product specialist with Federal Mogul Motor Parts. What are the techs saying about your visit? Every single time that I set up a training, I try to position the van inside the shop. You know, you're part of their house at that point. Whenever you set aside that time, you tell them that you're coming in, you're providing a lunch, and you're really bringing something of meat and value to the table. Once they get a taste of it, really, by the time you're done, they're asking, when can you come back? When can you come back? Or, hey, what else you got in your bag of tricks? Exactly. Exactly. So the greatest outcome of your visit to a, a professional shop? is just to really make a difference in their everyday procedures to maximize, obviously, maximize the premium end of the product that's being installed. But ultimately, for me being a next shop owner as well, is to maximize their profitability in installing the part right the first time and having a happy customer. I always say happy customer is like a happy wife, happy wife, happy life. Same thing goes with the customer. I've heard that before. So you take a Wagner OEX pad and you put it into the hands of a technician's. What happens? First off, they're floored with the cut design on the front end. They'd never seen a brake pad like this before. And then you start to break it down into why it's cut the way it is and how it's application or platform specific, how the backing plates are no longer painted, they're zinc coated, and that's for tolerance level. So that way you don't have a buildup on the ears and fitting into the hardware. I mean, you get into all the little nuances that they've changed around with that brake pad on top of the performance end of it. I mean, it's it's phenomenal. And then once they physically try the brake pad, either on a customer's car or their own vehicle, I've heard nothing but rave reviews about the brake pad. Federal Mogul Motor Parks' Garage Gurus is your go-to source for the vehicle training, technology, and answers you need to keep your next job on track. On site, online, or on demand, the gurus are here to help keep your business and your career on the road to success. Visit fmgarageguru.com. 
Have you ever had someone come up to you and say, you know, I, I was pretty stubborn back when you approached me, but thank you so much for uh, pointing these things out? Yes, actually I have, and especially when it was uh, using the price matrix. That was where I had the most opposition. Oh, you're just setting, setting the d- different uh, margin rates based, yes. based on the, the, the dollar value of the part? Right, Got and uh, you know what markup they yep. needed right. to stay in business, whether it was their labor rate or their parts markup rate. Mm-hmm. There's a certain a, a profit demand that you have to meet if you want to stay in business. And that's what I would work very hard trying to teach them. And it was for free. I didn't charge them. Any uh, any great stories about the uh, support you've given on a business side? Oh, over the years, I've given uh, a couple of shops. I won't mention any names, but it's a couple of shops that uh, they needed uh, to learn electronics. And, uh, and I told them, I said, guys, one of these days you're not going to be able to depend on me because I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be retired or I may, you know, I may have a heart attack and God wishes it not. But I said, you need to learn electronics. And then you need to learn how to charge for it. I said, you're not charging enough. And you need to learn how to learn, learn electronics because this stuff is going to kill you if you don't. You're going to guess and guess and guess. And when you read a code off a scan tool, all that code is gives, gives you a reference point of where to go to see where the problem is. That doesn't mean that's it. If it says solenoid B, it don't mean solenoid B is bad. I mean, if it says TPS, it don't mean the TPS is bad. It could be a ground. It could be a lot of things. That's, you really know how to learn, learn how, to, how to test these things. And there was a couple of them. I uh, had a little hard to get them to finally understand it, that they needed to learn it. And they're starting to learn now, and that's good. Because I, I, I can go down there, but I can't be there all the time. Tech training and business training, um, you never stop doing both? No. Never. Never. Never, never stop. Uh, I did give one uh, some advice the other day. He was looking to uh, purchase some property. And he, was, you know, he said, the banks want, you know, he said, they want my house. They want everything. And I said, <clears throat> he said, well, how did you do it? I said, well, I did them a little different. I had a friend that uh, wasn't making much money in the stock market, and he said that he would give me a construction loan to build my building. So I I purchased a property. He gave me a construction loan. I built the building. When when I got through, I was paying him uh, a certain percentage, just like a just like a regular loan in the bank. He said, "Do it, do it for the first five years, and if the, the banks go down, he said they'll come crawling for you." After five years, I had six banks wanting to, to take it over, which I did get one to take it over. No money out of my pocket. I didn't have to pay any money down, nothing. All I had to do was just I take the construction loan. I saved a ton of money, and I did the same thing with my house when I built my house. Good advice. Yeah. Really good Smart advice. Thinking. I, did, I did things similar to that. I had a gentleman ask me, and just to tell, you, tell your audience, never, ever – judge a book by its cover and the, and I, I don't want to go into a long story but i had this elderly gentleman that came into my business and of course in north carolina we do inspections and the safety part of our inspection is very very low pay well he would come in with his old mercedes diesel and nobody wanted to fool with him and uh, that's a cheap I, inspection. Yeah, I would, I, every year he'd come, every year he'd come in and inspect it. I'd inspect it for him. And one day he said to me, he says, uh, "When are you going to build your own shop?" And I said, "Well, Mr. Hunter, his name is Mr. Hunter." I said, "Mr. Hunter, I really can't get a loan. I've been dealing with uh, one of the larger banks, and they really won't finance me." And he pulled out his pencil and a card and wrote on the back of it. He said, "You call this man down at this bank." And he will take care of you. Well, when I got to the bank, lo and behold, Mr. Hunter was one of the original investors in that bank. He was very wealthy. I had no idea. I just serviced him like I would any customer. And I shot the breeze with him once in a while. And he done that for me. And that's how I got started. But getting back to your question on training, I insisted that my technicians train every year. My management team trained every year. I paid for it. I sent them during office hours. I did not require them to go at night. And I expected them to come back 
and give me my money back that I paid in Purdue or say production increases and it worked fine but only thing I can stress to your audience training 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 do not get behind because you'll never catch up that's true I mean we heard we heard some talk yesterday in the round table uh, you, you're right uh, a friend of mine G Julia says uh, update or evaporate that's true it's hard to get some of the text that want to do the training you know some of them just like to train on the job it seems like but gary says <laughs> this is required this is how it works it's in the job description there's this many hours a year i will pay for it you tell me what classes when you come back teach us teach the rest of the group what what, what you learned what's hard what's really hard about having that as a policy in your company unfortunately in the transmission business it's not a whole lot of training out it's not as it's not as it's not often, a, if you no, will. No, it's not as often yeah. as, as you. You probably have to travel to get it. Really, but it is. But so I did it myself. I trained my I trained my own men myself, uh, and I, I, I had a nephew that worked for me for a long time. I trained him how to build transmissions. I actually trained him how to how to run a shop. He didn't realize it at the time, uh, but now he's working for another company, and he's running a shop. And he called me up. And he says, Uncle Don. He says, I did not realize how much you taught me. Until I got out here on this shop, well, so and he thanked me. He said, "He said I, I didn't realize it." Well, see, there's this legacy thing that goes on. He says, "How am I going to be remembered?" Oh, please don't say anything about that. <laughs> well, you got a great, I actually uh, you got a good thank you from your nephew. Yeah, I actually I actually think that uh, from the people that know me here, uh, I think if I, something happened to me right now, I would I would be proud of the way they would handle it and the way they would talk about me. What are they going to say about you, Gary? They probably would say that he was strictly business. He never used any emotions during business hours. It was do the job, do it right. Don't expect me to pat you on the back because it's not going to happen. But your paycheck will reflect it, and so will your year-end bonus. And after hours, we're friends. He's a great guy. Don't let him pull your leg. He's a great guy. We all, we all, we all love him today. He's got a big toothy smile. We I don't yeah. believe him at all. Yeah, we, all, we, all we all love him. He knows yeah. it. But, you know, I, I get the all business part. I really do. But, but yeah, obviously you were, you were probably just a big, cuddly owner, right, that people well, just love I, to work for. I never – if my, any of the employees needed help financially or other ways – I would always help them, but I still expected them to do the job and do it properly. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, that's probably what I mean about being all business. Do the job because I used to tell them, I says, what would you do for someone that made your house payment, made your car payment, bought your groceries, clothed your children? What would you do for that person? And I actually talk to every employee like this and they'd always say i would do anything i said that is your customer i said that's my customer and that's your customer so do it that's the sound bite that's right a good there. statement thank that's you a good that's statement a good there. statement but yeah, see, I, sure I, yeah I always told mine i said you know i said take pride in what you do i said and, and because let me tell you every car that comes out of this shop these, come, some of the customers may not know you because we're doing transmission work because I get a lot of referrals from other shops. I said, but my name is on this, and it's my name only, and the person that gets chewed out if it's not right is me. So if you do, do not want me to chew you out, you do a good job, and I'll reward you for it. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and so, and, and I was very direct, sometimes a little bit too, too direct, but I got the point across. And, and when, they, when they worked for me, they knew they had to work. So I got it. How are they going to remember me? You said, I think they'll treat me okay. Don was very direct. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. And uh, all I'm going to tell you that. Gary will probably tell you. I, I am. Well, I, I think we can sense it here. Oh, just yeah. our, our, our interview that's gone on for about 20 minutes. Tell me, how about you? What are people going to say about you? I don't know. I think they'll probably say that he tried to fix my vehicle and he tried to fix it right. Tried to fix it for, for a fair price. I've enjoyed working with cars, and maybe I may be a little bit like the others. Uh, I 
really enjoyed working on cars better than I did trying to deal with the issue between a mechanic and a and a shop owner. You you want to keep your prices uh, low in order to attract customers somewhat, but you've got to keep it high in order to attract techs, and so that's a bit of a struggle in between the two. But if you can turn out quality work then uh, that kind of leans you towards the customer more. That, that's a perfect segue to talk about, you know, our techs, you know, earning a, a decent living. Gary, I mean, I know you're passionate about that. I am passionate about that. What should we be doing? Unfortunately, our labor rates are going to have to go up considerably. And the owners, shop owners, companies can't keep the money. They have to share it. And we need to have that entry-level technician. We have to stop depending on young, single men or women that live with mom and daddy. We have to depend on employees that have families, that have responsibilities. And in our, it's going to be our job to make sure they can survive. They can buy their groceries. They can buy their automobile, pay rent or pay mortgage, whatever. Go out to dinner. And at this point in our industry, that's not happening. Most shop owners, and I can't say 20%, 50%, or 80%, try to pay those entry-level technicians the least amount they have to. And in turn, that brings us a lot of entry-level technicians that won't ever be able to to be a good technician simply because they don't have the skill and even if you trained them they couldn't retain the skill we have to have the technician that understands electronics especially in modern vehicles they are no mechanical solenoids maybe the starter solenoid everything else is controlled by a module and all the modules have to talk to each other on a cam system and until we realize that caliber of employee is going to have to make between fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars a year at entry level. Sounds like a lot of money, but we're going to have to charge to compensate for it. I spoke this uh, this morning. Uh, the, this, the door of the studio was open. Uh, an instructor came in. His first name was Rick. I have his card. He's an automotive tech, and he says, you know, we're losing students to the uh, manufacturing area. There's this big manufacturing area, and I can't remember where he said it was. And he says, CNC, machine operators, right out of high school, he tells me. They'll put them through training and everything if they find the right person. Sixty to seventy-five thousand dollars to start a CNC. That is true. Manager, production guy. Yeah. I can tell you, Tom. I sat on my local county's economic development committee board, and of course, on the board, our job is to entice manufacturing to come to our county. Entry level, and one of the companies that work with specialty metals, titanium mm-hmm. stuff like that. Entry level is $66,000 a year, plus, plus insurance, health insurance, $100 a month per family, the whole family, vacation time, holiday time, uh, controlled atmosphere. They're not working in 100-degree temperatures like our technicians are. So we have to compete against them, and they are – hurting for employees just as well as every other industry, whether it's plumbers, electricians, HVAC people. We cannot get enough young people in to do that type of work. So some of the magic here is growing your top line, having the right labor rate, controlling your costs so that that bottom line can afford to pay and retain and benefit the technicians of the future, the technicians that need to stay so that the business stays whole. We, we say it over and over on the show all the time, and we've heard it here ad nauseum. Every little networking meeting, every, everything that's going on, all the trainers that are out there, they're, they're, they're hammering this. When's, when's it going to sink in? When we grew up and started, we loved what we did, and we thrived because we wanted to be better at it, and we wanted to do the best job possible, and we wanted to make it work and work right. The new breed, it's, it's all about... You know, they're 
scan tools, their their, their uh, pocket uh, cal- calculators, and everything. They have to really want to do the work, or or you're spinning your wheels. I don't care how much you pay them. If they don't really want to do this work and they don't want to like it, they're not going to do a good job. But what if they're not trained? Then they can't do the work. They can't. They have. Well, that has to be part and, of your program. And, and so uh, you're also what you're also saying, Don. Yeah. Listen, if if you don't enjoy what you do, the owner needs to make that tough decision and move on and find someone who has that passion. I have hired people out of the technical schools after they graduate, and I'm telling you, they didn't know what I could teach them in two months. How long ago? Huh? Well, right before I got right before I closed up. Really? When I sold the business. All right. So it didn't mean that long ago. Yeah, I know. I hired one, and sometimes they turn out the guys that have a good grade. I I went to a graduation uh, to uh, at a local tech school, and I hired one of the guys that graduated, and he had the gold cord. You know, he was a 4.0 graduate. But if you wanted to have a fuel pump replaced on a car, and I'm not kidding, this is true, he would tear up the first fuel pump trying to put it on, and then he would be able to successfully install maybe the second pump. Same thing with the water pump. I'd give him a water pump. The second water pump, he got that one to work and got it on. And uh, if you uh, give him an oil change, you better give him a speedy, a bag of speedy dry to go with it because uh, he would leave the drain plug loose or he would leave the oil filter loose. And... Uh, had to had to let him go, and he just he just uh, he was a smart guy, but he couldn't do the job. But isn't we're hearing this? We're hearing that the students that are coming out of post secondary will are not as in depth to the jobs that you want to give them. But if you thought of them coming in as an apprentice, and you know not an intern anymore, but an, an apprentice, then your job is to walk them through those <laughs> chairs, if you will, of knowledge and levels and training. Really outline a career path for them. While as they move forward, the money starts increasing, so they're so they can look down the road and say, "Ooh, I like this." You know, I'm starting at sixteen dollars an hour, but at the end of this road that takes me out of the apprentice program, it's going to be twenty five. But here's what I have to do. Yes, you let them loose on a job. If you slowed them in a little bit, you may not you may not defect too many parts. <laughs> well, some of the software we have nowadays. You can print out a picture and could show you pretty much on how to take something off and put it back as far as, like, water pumps and fuel pumps and stuff. I had a technician that went through a, a trade school and was out a year working, a, working somewhere else in another, in another shop or a, a dealership. Came to my shop. I said, can you do brakes and all this stuff? Yeah. You sure? Yeah, I can do it. There's a truck right there. Pull it in and put the brakes on it. He had the back wheels off. He just stood and looked at them and stared at them. Wow. And I says, what, what, are, what are you doing? I sent my other guy back. I said, find out what he's doing. He comes back. He says, he don't know how to get the drums off. So I went back. And I said, you don't know how to do drum brakes? He said, well, no, I don't know how to do drum brakes. I said, oh, okay. I said, we'll show you. And that was a nightmare. I said, and you, and you went to trade school, and then you went to work for a dealership for a year. What did you do? And he, well, I changed the oil and service, service them. And that, we hear this all the time. The, 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 the newbies are, are put in into a lube for too long, and they lose interest, but they're not also learning. And I think the job of hiring a post-secondary grad is to look at them as a child uh, that you, you need to teach yeah. everything, you know, how, how to walk, how to talk, how to, how, to, how to be a contributor to society. I think you have responsibility. You can't hire and abdicate. You have to hire and educate. Yeah. When I hired, and I hired a few tech school techs, but when they came in, as far as I was concerned, they didn't know anything, and I treated them as such. I wanted to see everything they did, or my supervisor see it. The only thing I can say about them, they had really nice toolboxes when they come in, and within six months when they left, they still had that nice toolbox, but not a job, because they were arrogant they knew more about the business than I did. So I let them go help someone else. But that was my experience with trade school techs, that they pay all that money. I understand it was like forty grand a year to go, and or two years, whatever the period was. And as far as I'm concerned, they came away with no skills whatsoever. They could have learned more as Don said, working with me for six months. 
But that's what we have to deal with in our industry, and it's up to us to make sure that they do it the correct way. Regardless what that instructor told them in school, we, we live in a real world. We don't live in that fantasy. Oh, sometimes, sometimes I think a person is born with something. I had one guy that I hired, and he was a taxi cab driver. And I don't know why I hired him. It's just that sometimes you're talking to somebody and you say you see something that you like about him. And he is one of the best computer techs I had ever seen. He really fell in there. And I found out whenever he went home at night, he didn't sit down there and watch some kind of movie. He got on the Internet and went to automotive sites. And he really was passionate and he learned how to work on cars. I had another guy that I had hired uh, and he was not a tech graduate either, and uh, he wasn't a high school graduate. He didn't graduate from high school, but he is, without a doubt, the best electrical guy that I've ever seen, and you take some of these later model cars with these complex circuits where you have uh, all these modules tied into a wiring harness, and he could tell you what was wrong with that car, and he hardly ever missed it either. And he, he was really smart. He was just born with it, that's all I can say. Some of our techs have gifts. Oh, yeah. And, they have natural abilities. Yes, yeah. natural ability. The in- intuition, smarts. And, you know, I've heard this an awful lot uh, about uh, the studying at home and the preparing for the next day, knowing a drivability problem that's coming Most guys in. don't do that. When they get home, they like to wash their hands of everything. You know, they have families. I know that. I really know. I get that. I mean, you know, you, you have work time and you have home time and you got to give to the family and the, and the wife but then some of the guys say hey once everybody's to bed i'm going out and doing a little research getting me juiced up for tomorrow i used to dream about them repaired some transmissions in my sleep i'd wake up in the middle of the night and scream and my wife was scared half to death and, and i'd say i got it i got it because i had one had, a, had an electronic problem with it you're getting kind of tough in my, in my dreams i would fix it and actually it worked it's so true. Sometimes you, you think things so deep, so, so thorough, and you, 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 for the first time you walk into a situation that you, if you dreamed or th- thought about, and it just feels like natural because you it's just, I've been here. I've never been here, but I've been here. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. I've seen times when you would uh, go home at night and you would not want to go back to work the next day. I worked at a, as a tech for quite a while, and I did not want to go back to work the next day because I knew what was waiting on me when I got back to work the next day was a car i had worked on the previous day all day long and didn't know what was wrong with it and when i was working at that point you couldn't go to youtube and go on the internet and find out how to fix a car that you couldn't figure out and i would say man i just don't want to go back to work tomorrow but uh sometimes just take it easy good night's rest you go back refreshed the next day you could find out what the problem was fix the car and you feel pretty good you're right about that. Hey, uh, let's talk about professionalism in our industry. Sure. Got any opinions on that, Gary? I do. I think every shop owner, every technician needs to view themselves as professionals, just like any other industry, whether it's a plumber, electrician, software writer, because we actually do all the professional industries work in our industry. Maybe not carpentry, but we do most of the rest. And demand that your customers treat you with respect that a professional gets. Because if you don't, people won't treat you as a professional. They're always going to undervalue what you do for them. We're not a trade, uh, trade treat mechanic anymore. You know, these are, these are highly, highly technicians, and you know, they should be treated as, as such. Well, my whole career, I demanded my customers treat me as a professional. When I went into the industry, I was a professional. I studied. I did whatever was necessary. But they weren't going to treat me like I was just someone off the street that couldn't do anything else. And, of course, my business was successful. Thanks for the advice, man. Hey, it's so great to have Tommy Kendall here, semi-retired, 79 years old. God bless you, man. Thanks for being here. Gary Summerfield, fully retired, former shop owner, and Don Griffin, Dr. Don, direct. fully retired. <laughs> Don, yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> very direct. <laughs> yeah, the very direct Dr. Don. I love it. Thanks for being here, guys. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.
Hey, thanks Gary Summerfield, Don Griffin, and Tommy Kendall for your legacy and for sharing your story to help mold the next generations. The episode's key talking points can be found at remarkableresults.biz slash E373. And for your information, I'll be doing a live Town Hall Academy on November 2nd, 2018 from Las Vegas, Nevada at Frank's European. The show is about the value of shop tours, and Frank and I are inviting all who will be at Industry Week and in the area to stop by at 9 a.m. on November 2nd and get a tour and spend some time looking at Frank's business. Just Google Frank's European, and I'll see you there. Talk soon. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time... 